from ABC News Radio, KMET 1490 in Southern California. This is Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with your host, Tyler Jorgensen. Welcome out to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio. I am your host, Tyler Jorgensen, and today we have Christian Ruth, who has founded a really amazing uh product, if you will, but it's more than that. It's a solution to one of the biggest problems in e-commerce, uh, and that is product sizing. And so I'm excited to, t- uh, to have Christian out on the show and to talk about his journey and about MySureFit.com. So welcome out to the show, Christian. Thank you, Tom, for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So you, uh, you're solving a problem that's real, right? And so let's, uh, but I want to, we're going to come back to MySureFit here in a little bit. Let's wind the wind the time, wind the clock back on Christian Ruth. When was the first time you realized that you are an entrepreneur? It's a great question. Um, I actually worked, you know, in, in investment banking and private equity for a number of years. But on the side, I was always experimenting uh, because I always wanted to try to, you know, have a big impact on the world doing something. And uh, learned a lot from the people that I was uh, that I've been fortunate enough to work for and work with. And uh, uh, once I started you know, tinkering in various types of opportunities and seeing the kind of impact that you can have as an entrepreneur, um, I realized, I realized that I could, I could potentially do something great. And uh, it would really come down to uh, the quality of my leadership capabilities. Um, it's one of the biggest challenges I think that entrepreneurs deal with is they may have an idea or a plan or a goal, but at the end of the day, you have to have a team. You have to be able to attract high quality people uh, in order to pursue a certain, you know, in order to realize a certain vision. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, so, and I enjoy that. Like I really, I've always enjoyed uh, being given the opportunity to, to follow, to learn, and then to, to lead, whether it was a small team or, or a larger, you know, division or whatever it might be. Um, and so I enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed helping people achieve their potential. Um, you know, no matter what you do, no matter what product or service you start, you know, you, you develop or create, and no matter how much money you may or may not make, you know, you don't take any with you, you know, at the end of the day, right? So what really matters is the impact that you have on people and frankly, their families or other people that are dependent on them in order to help them to, to grow and reach their, uh, reach their objectives. And so I think I just, I enjoy doing that. Um, and, uh, and I think that's one of the, the things that are essential for, um, in my opinion, for, for entrepreneurship, because you, you're not going to do it all, all, you know, you're not going to do it all on your own. Yeah. So now, I mean, you mentioned you were in investment banking. You weren't just in investment banking. You evaluated over a thousand deals a year and, and were like part of over $28 billion in M and A deals. Like this, these are not small numbers. This isn't like some, you know, these, this, you were, you were playing big games, right? And, uh, and now you're launching your own thing. What made you decide to go out on your own? So I appreciate that. I, I worked with, uh, I was fortunate to have earned the opportunity to work with some of the best people in the space, uh, in, in the technology investment banking uh, world, um, as well as in, in, in private equity and technology, private equity, um, literally learned from some of the best players in, in, in those industries some of the best on, on the planet, frankly. Um, but I, they also uh, let me experiment, and uh, I liked the operational aspects of businesses. And so, you know, going back over twenty years ago, I had the opportunity to sort of, you know, work with a a, a very early stage startup, and we got that into contract, have it have it acquired by somebody, and I just enjoyed the the ability to have an impact when you're working as uh, as, a, as an investment banker or maybe as a private equity investor. Yes, you can have an impact and you have this responsibility to help those, those companies, their shareholders have a good outcome, but it's not the same as being responsible for decisions, right? It's very different in that world. In that world, you're shooting for, you know, perfection, 99, 100%, everything you're doing, right? And it's very clear if you got something wrong pretty quickly. Right. In the business world, when you're in, in an operating role, you are trying to make perfect decisions with a, a breadth of, of information sources with imperfect information. And if you're hitting 70, 80% of those decisions correctly, you have a home, you know, you're doing well. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. And so the, the key in entrepreneurship, my, my opinion, I enjoyed the, and I enjoy the complexity 
and the difficulty of operating in uncertain environments. Sure. Um, you, I know you mentioned me about my background. I started flying years ago, and it's very similar. You know, as a, as a, as an aviator, especially depending on on the the the, uh, the complexity of rings that you hold, the situations get more and more complicated right over time. And you're trying to make decisions as a pilot. It's a weather issue. You lose an engine. You have an in you know an, an, an in cabin fire. And there's various things that can happen. And you have to be prepared to respond to that in multivariable, you know, types of emergency situations. So I just enjoy, uh, for me, I enjoy the adrenaline phenomena of facing a really hard problem, knowing you don't have all the information necessarily, and trying to overcome that challenge as, as quickly as you can. And frankly, enjoying the volume of as many of those as you can deal with. Um, yeah. And and so I think the other thing that I really liked about entrepreneurship is that. You, you really want to go after something that's really, really hard to do, really hard to do, because most businesses that you see, Tyler, are really, there's sort of a feature benefit or there's a slight benefit of what you want to do versus what somebody else wants to do. And the reality is those businesses don't last really long. They may last for some period of time. They may win on pricing or some incremental feature or whatnot. But if you want to build something great, you have to... Um, find a problem that is really, really big that impacts a lot of people and, and go after it, and um, which is exciting, but it's also incredibly challenging. It's really, really hard. And that's why the cultural aspects of your organization have to be the values that you stand for and things you pursue are, are paramount. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why, going back to your question earlier, that, that I enjoy the challenge of that. I enjoy the challenge of of developing teams and 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 encouraging humility, right? Because we're not we're not naturally humble, right? We we want to be the best. We think we are the best. We always think we're performing better than we think we are. And getting people to to be honest with themselves and try to try to get really good at doing something and expanding their capabilities and helping their teammates, you know, do the same thing. And and over time, what happens is I'm not really telling people what to do. I'm just trying to make sure they have what they need to do to be able to realize their potential based on the values that they're demonstrating. Right. So to me, to, and this is a long answer to your question, to me, helping people achieve greatness through, through the perseverance of certain critical values, humility, adaptability, intellectual curiosity, perseverance, things of that nature. Um, if I can help them develop those, those and, and strengthen those capabilities, they're gonna win no matter where they are, whether they're working right. With us, or they're working with somewhere, you know, they're working, you know, somewhere else. And that's, and frankly, I learned some of those cap those qualities from the people that mentored me, you know, years ago. I was fortunate to work for 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 some of the best and the brightest. So, and then most competitive, you know, incredibly driven, you know, um, you know, people that I worked with over the years. I love that. Now, when it when you decided to like make the pivot and start your own company. Did you like you? So first of all, mysurefit.com is not a brand new idea, right? You've been working at this for a long time, um, and I think you're, but you're still really in the early stages of how big it has its potential, right? Now, a lot of people working in a business, putting eight nine years into something, and knowing that it's going well, but it could go, you know, it, there's you're still on the beginning of its potential. How have you kept motivated, like throughout that time? First of all, when I looked at look at anything, and, and before I started, you know, sort of co-founded my SureFit, I looked at, I was looking at my own invest. I was I was investing in buying other businesses and whatnot. And my view is always, we have to be prepared to fail at any point in time, right? So I mean, right out of the gate, it could be three months in, six months in, whatever it might be. Okay. Yep. So my my general view is that expect to fail, but strive to strive to win. Right. And the way you handle that is you start setting very tight near-term milestones. Is there actual demand for this? How do we validate demand at the lowest possible cost, right? How do we get a prototype or a concept used for validation and for testing as quickly as possible? And you're going to think that I'm crazy, but I've been prepared to walk away at any point in time, even after years of, of, of you know working at it, but I don't because the demand indicators continue to improve and our capabilities also continue to, to improve. I mean, the scope of what we can do now compared to what we could do even, even two years ago is, is exponentially higher than it was back then. So I, I think now is a great time to, to really help us understand what MySureFit is and what you guys are doing in the marketplace. 
Sure. So uh, as you probably know, you know, you know, uh, have you ever, have you or your wife ever gone shopping for apparel online? Of course. Okay. okay. And do they end up ordering multiple sizes because you're not sure what size to get? I, yeah, it happens all the time. And what, and what do you do when you receive it? Right. You, go through, it you try them all on and you send the ones, the ones back that you don't like. Right. Right. So it's a, it's a huge problem, right? So millions of people are, are experiencing this. I saw years ago, just based on my technology experience and, and, and my belief in, in consumer uh, behavioral changes, that you know, years ago, you know, e-commerce apparel sales were less than 10% of the market just a few years ago. Right. They were most, most of those purchases were, were done in store. But I knew that at some point, people would start shopping more and more online. And unlike most industries where when people would shop online and they were getting what they were expecting, whether it's a widget or, you know, something that's, 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 that's tangible, right. Fashion is very personal, right? And you've got, you know, billions of people that have different style preferences, different fit preferences. You've got, you know, thousands of brands that manufacture garments uh, and, and have different sizing spectrums that vary even within brand. So the challenge that I saw years ago was that as the industry tried to move online, online would actually be a pain point, a major pain point for them because the information gaps, what I call them, that did not exist in store. Like your wife would go in store with her girlfriends, they see a dress they like, they can try it, they can take two, three sizes in the fitting room, try them on, come back, put them back on the rack and buy the one that they want to buy. Online, that's very different. Now she has to purchase in advance two to three sizes have them sent. She may or may not like it. She might send them back. But the problem is her best friend who also might want a similar item, might want that specific item because your wife and those are ordering two, three sizes. They may face a stock out, right? Because the manufacturers weren't prepared to have a hyper distributed fulfillment trial system. Just because people are buying online doesn't mean they're keeping when they buy online, right? right. So her friends may face a stock out or brand manufacturers or retailers would have to stock an exponential increase in the number of, of, of items to fulfill that, that artificial demand, if you will. It's not real demand. It's artificial. Yep. It's temporary artificial demand, right? So I understood the, 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 the mathematic, mathematical risk and the economic risk that that phenomenon would have in the broader market. And also, it would affect consumer experiences. If it doesn't fit, you might may abandon the brand. I mean, you not come back to the brand. There's a lot of other aspects that, that affect that. So we began examining uh, at a detailed level, and I've got a number of you know, strategic advisory board members that, that, that sort of I worked with in this process to really study consumer behavior, really understanding right. why do they shop in store? Why do they shop online? What are the different you know, consumer uh, flows all the way through to purchasing and keeping an item to understand not just the mechanics of those, of those processes, but also the underlying um, psychological, emotional phenomena that go through that entire, you know, that, that ex it exists for both of those journeys. And we began just developing an experience and a capability that would, re that would reduce the frustration with online shopping and even to some extent in-store shopping as well and, uh, and, and reduce the return rates. Because my view at the time was if this problem is not addressed, a significant number of brand retail will go out of business. They'll yeah, go out of business absolutely. because because if I came to you and said, "Hey, I want to start a fashion apparel company," and here's my model, I'm going to send out you know three dresses for everyone that gets ordered, and you know two are going to come back, all three may come back, one of them may be damaged. You know, there's no way you can make money on that business. So, not only does it help the consumer, it really helps the brand retailers, and it also helps the environment because if you consider the fact that they're having to over manufacture to deal with that artificial demand. Now you have a, a huge problem because at the end of the season, what happens? You you know you don't want the parachute pants anymore now, right? I mean that you know right. the, the, the things trend out, right? And yep. so not only have they wasted all that money manufacturing, they've wasted materials, they've wasted labor, they've you know, and so they either discount the items or they or they end up destroying the items. So it, it's so my shirt sure allows allows brand from the brand's perspective, uh, better supply chain management, right? Better uh, better predictability and forecasting. Better uh, ability, better user experience. Exactly. Right? Better, better, yeah. you know, customer experience. From the customer's perspective, you get clothes that fit. Like <laughs> they don't. It's funny because like consumers don't necessarily care about the consumer experience. They're not thinking about it like that. They're just thinking about did I get what I wanted right without having to jump through too many hoops. 
And, uh, and so they're not dissecting the consumer experience. They just know if they had a good experience or not. Did I feel good when I bought from that company or not? Um, and so you guys are solving this problem on, from both sides, right? So it's, it's not just a solution for the retailers or sellers. It's, it's on yours. So how does somebody interact with my sure fit? Like so from a consumer the, side. Yeah. And, and you're right. And everything we started off with was we were laser focused on the consumer first because I could tell you I've got some phenomenal product to sell a brand retailer. But then it, it always begins and ends with the consumer. So we want them to have maximum convenience and confidence because we know they're buying that garment for a specific girls night out or an interview or whatever it might be. So basically, the consumer can easily you know, visit our website or they can download the app. They can in, in, in less than a minute, they can upload their photo. Our technology, it's patented, it measures them with a 99% accuracy. And we can size them across hundreds of brands, uh, tens of thousands of different styles, and they can visualize the actual items on their bodies. They can mix and match uh, and have a good idea of how things would actually look. We understood that this was an important information gap that needed to be closed as people moved online. And it's not just, does the dress fit her? The question is, what if she's trying to create an outfit, right? Going back to the consumer contextual experience, like you mentioned the experience. Yeah. She wants to go out for casual night out with her girlfriends and she wants to get a new you know, blouse and a pair of jeans. Well, how did those blouse and jeans actually fall together, right? And they can't, they can't tell that right now from existing e-commerce platforms, right? They, they know right. there's a blouse, they know there's a pair of jeans, but can they put them together to see how they would actually look together, right? Or put it, our technology features multi-level layering, so it automatically layers a jacket wow. or you know, other pieces together. So we knew that in order to trigger the consumer uh, commitment to want to upload that photo, we knew we had to give them a really, really rewarding experience. And so they can do that. They can also... Uh, share the outfit digitally with your girlfriends or other friends, husband, whoever, to get feedback. So you're 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 giving them much more information before they would ever have to pull out their credit card to make a purchase. Yeah, uh, so and I mean, the there's do. there's a really there's a nuance between uh, sizing in some different companies, right? Like you know, in some companies, you know, you're you're one size, and another company, you order that size and it won't fit at all, right? And so. This allows your guys' technology allows basically a, a virtual scan of the person, and then you overlay the the brand's sizing into that picture and allow them to find what works in each brand. I mean, is that a decent summary of it all? Yeah, it, it's 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 a little more complex than that, but you work well. Correct. But I'm talking about a consumer yes. doesn't compare about complexity, right? They want yes. to know what does it do for me. Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. On the tech yes, side, I, it's way more complex, right? Well, and, I, well, it's it's important for them to to us that they understand the, what it does and how it works. Tyler, I wasn't want to trust it, right? Yeah, so that's we true. want them to Absolutely. know that before they go to you know take the take the steps to upload their photo, that they can trust that we're going to deliver. The, the, hit the nail on the head when you said that there's nuances. There are definitely um, even within brain, within a specific brand, you will the way garments are designed using fit models and whatnot. There's a range of, of size spectrums. Sizing is effectively a language, right? And mass right. production goes back to the Civil War. And unfortunately, consumers think that they're a two or a three or a four or an extra small. You're none of that. With my shirt fit, you're none of that. You don't even have to see. You don't have to think about sizing. You just select my shirt fit. And we wow. just deliver the proper size from the garment to that uh, to that consumer, which frees them from the guilt. I don't know if you've seen this, but we certainly saw it in, in, in test sessions. The users or customers are like, well, I'm, I know I'm a two. Like they feel guilty. It's terrible. They yeah, feel and they feel guilty us. just selecting the nest size up, even though right. it's going to fit better and they're going to feel better. Right. And, and, and that's why you saw the introduction of vanity sizing years ago, right? It's manipulative. The brands and the brands sort of introduce, oh, you're not small. You're, you're not even extra small. You're extra, 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 extra small. I mean, it's, right. it's, it's ridiculous, right? So it's just sizing is just a language. And we're basically the translator between uh, the, with, with consumers' unique body shapes, which we can, can scan with 99% accuracy and reconcile that with, with proprietary information that we have created to ensure that they get the, the, best, uh, the best size from those various styles and all those brands.
So you guys, I mean, I, this is amazing because I, I knew people that tried that got into this space or started to try to get into this space a decade plus ago, right? You guys have been innovating and on the forefront of this for that long. Um, what was the first big brand that you got to buy in? Cause obviously this only, this works really well. If, if you, the consumers and the brands are buying right. in, what was your first big win? I would say, so this interesting story. So when we first started testing, uh, years ago, we worked with a, with a very small number of brands. Um, and what happened is during our test sessions, because we were doing two things during our product development, we were testing our fit algos and our, our te- fit technology as well as the customer user experience on the visualization, okay? And the whole, everything in in, in between. What happened is during that testing, consumers were trying to buy our apparel. We were literally using test samples. Right. And they would say, hey, we want to buy it. You you can't buy These are test samples. And I talked to our board and I said, hey, wait a second. These folks want to buy now. I mean, we're, we're in development right now, but they want to buy now. I have a crazy idea. Why don't I see if I can get some brands to sign up to, to wholesale for us? Right. And so they approved. We went and, and I, I think one of the big, big steps is a couple of years ago, we ended up having demand, Tyler, in less than a few weeks of probably over 500 brands that oh, wanted wow. to work with. Probably in about, in about a three to six month period, all the big ones. I mean, big jeans companies, big, and I don't want to favor anybody because they're all, I want to, but they, these are some of the biggest brands in the world. So, I mean, they were really impressed with the demand. We were because we were showing the brands. This is our these are our test results, and this is what people want to do. And so they said, "Great, we'll start. You know, we'll open up for you right now." I mean, you know, we didn't have a we didn't yeah. have a single store anywhere, and they were they were opening up for us. So, so is um, is your model the fact that you like do you buy all these products and warehouse them and ship them out directly from my Surefit, or are you drop shipping and are people buying on your app and then? Drop the, yeah, the brand retails now drop ship for us. So back in the earlier days, we did some wholesaling, but but our vision was always to have the brand retailers drop ship. There's there's enough warehouses in the world, so we don't need to yeah. you know we don't need to create a warehouse. What I agree. We need to do is, well, is just shorten the time. Yeah, I think it's fascinating because ten years ago, drop shipping was like kind of a naughty word, right? Like people frowned upon it, but most brands have under, understand now, Hey, you know what? We're happy to do this for the right brand partners. If you can come to us with a good enough reason, we have an, we have a supply chain system and a, and a right. fulfillment system. We can plug you in, but you have to have a good enough reason. It's not like I decided to start a new website and just drop ship Levi's. That's no, they, they can right. sell Levi's without you, but you created it something that was so unique where they knew that by having you guys drop ship or sell their products, that they would have a better customer experience. And that's really, yeah, I, I can, I, for, I can give you an example, for example, like with H and M, um, you know, our return rate with them has been, I think almost 0%. Wow. I mean, years ago, they had a massive inventory challenge and you may not, you may not be aware of this, but they had a massive, it was a seasonal trend kind of an issue. They were sitting on $4 billion of inventory. Yeah. I mean, they're so a fast imagine, fashion company. So like, right. you can't, you can't miss. Right. Right. So the trend issue there is, is critical. And so, you know, the fact that we can, you know, deliver, you know, meaningful sales and not have the return, the unit economics for them are incredibly valuable. Yeah. Um, and so in that case, to your point, they will drop ship all day long. You know, the, the reason they didn't want to drop ship before, other than some of the technical limitations that they may have had, was the return issue. Oh, How totally. many returns? Yeah. Right. And so now, and, and, and it was easier from a business model perspective, they would rather sell a brand would rather sell a, a box volume to a major multi-brand retail, Nordstrom's, Macy's, Cole, yeah. whoever it might be, Bloomingdale's, whoever, right? But in our model, right, they actually benefit of having that single size, not multiple sizes, a single size being shipped to the customer. The customer's keeping it, customer loves it, now the customer loves the brand. So we're agnostic about the brands, right? As long as the, we will work with any brand that has demonstrated demand for their product, and has good manufacturing quality. Uh, we've we have just we have we have I've yeah because si- if this breaks, if their size consistency is garbage, right? It doesn't right. work. That's exactly right. Yeah, right. Or, or, or their many or their garment quality or the design, you know, the materials quality isn't good enough. So, so yeah, we, we've I think we had over a thousand plus brands that wanted to work with us, and and we've called a lot of that back to make sure that they actually have that they can meet the standards that we promise our users. We want to make yeah. sure that our, our customers have a good experience, and and then their customers. Have a good experience. How many transactions have you guys done now through MySureFit? Uh, tens of thousands. Wow, it's not in startup anymore. 
<laughs> no, no, it's definitely in scale mode, and that's yeah, that, that's why that's we, we cool. bought in a brand new. Yeah, we've uh, no, we're, we're we're going full commercialization, and we just opened up our technology uh, for licensing for major uh, brands and and, and, and multi brand retailers uh, because we want everybody in the world to use MySureFit, and uh, and where economics work, we have a small percentage of of transactions and whatnot, and we're we believe in. And guaranteeing those results, and we're we're in prepared you know, to stand by the, behind those uh, the, the, those commitments. Um, so we're really excited about it. And it's been years of brutal, brutal development testing and retesting, and you know, it's just on, on, ongoing. Yeah. So not from the tech side, but from the business growth in general, what was one of the biggest challenges that you faced uh, as you kind of you know you knew that you had something that was going to work, you had the tech side figured out, but you like what was the first wall that you hit, and how'd you overcome it? Well, there's been a lot of different challenges over the years. I mean, my vision was to have millions of users using this technology at mass scale. And so you rightly pointed out the consumer doesn't care. They just want to know they can get the brands they want and as, as easy as, as they can. But in order to make that scalable, that's a big deal. That's a really, really big deal. And so we just kept hitting those, as I mentioned, those near-term milestones, prove this, prove this, prove this. Um, I would, well, actually, I have, I have a funny story. So we unexpectedly surged last year. Mm-hmm. We had a, a, a tremendous amount of demand for the, for the product, you know, o- overnight. And, uh, you know, more than we expected to have. And the brands couldn't keep up with our actual order demand. They were actually running into stockouts on their own. And so that was sort of a challenge. Um, and we, had, we took care of our customers. We gave them you know, additional incentives and, 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 and took care of them in, in, in that process. But that was a big, that was sort of a big, uh, what would you call it? A kind of a double-edged sword. It was like, I mean, it exploded. We had, we had it, it, overnight, we had you know, thousands of orders. I mean, literally like within, within 24 hours or so. Um, so that was a really big challenge. It was exciting, but it was also, uh-oh, you know, are they really ready to handle this, this, this demand, this volume for us? And so that was, I would say that was probably a big challenge. And then as a result of that, but again, like any challenge you learn and you find out, okay, what could have made this faster? What could have made this better? What could have ensured that there was, there was no, there were no hiccups or gaps and whatnot. And we spent a lot of time closing those kind of implementation and, and, and fulfillment delivery gaps, you know, with the brands to make sure that those, uh, those issues would be addressed. And, you know, you know, months later we're we're in a much 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 stronger position and then also at the time we didn't even have the ability to, to license that technology out to the brands that we do now right so there's just there's just more we just responded our we, we again going back to point do people actually want this well yeah they definitely wanted it yeah and now we absolutely. have to be able to be able to, be able to be able to scale it i love it christian and so i hope everyone goes and checks out my download the app check it out next thing next time you buy something online you should be buying it through my surefit but what uh christian i'm a big believer that business is about building the lifestyle you want you're a father of five you've got a big life going on what's one major item on your personal bucket list you're going to accomplish this year that's a great question uh i would probably say uh to have my uh my five-year-old finish her her reading skills and uh, for my my 10-year-old to finish her first uh her first software development application. She started doing self uh, software, self teaching software development at uh, Harvard on an online course. Uh, yeah, uh, last year. So I hope she can she can get her first uh, product out. Awesome, that's cool. So just all full time dad mode whenever you're not building my sure fit. I love it. That and kids soccer. I don't mean these, these kids sports nowadays. It's seven days a week. So it's yeah. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Christian. Really appreciate it. everyone. Go check out my sure fit if uh, if you wear clothes you should be using mysurefit.com. So uh, thank you for coming out and all my biz ninjas, wherever you're listening, it's your turn to go out and do something. Thank you for listening to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio with Tyler Jorgensen. Please make sure to subscribe so you're first to hear new interviews and episodes. If you found this podcast to be valuable, please share it with a friend. Don't forget to visit our online dojo at bizninja.com to claim your reward for listening to the show.